Who's that? It's time to get black, y'all. life. It's me, Craig Robinson, and today I'll be your Sherpa, helping you navigate a 29,000 feet above sea level mountain of legendary blackness. Plus, I brought snacks and stuff too in case you get hungry on the way up. We've got something special today. Let's just say a plant stylist, an Olympian, and a badass CEO walk into a bar. No punchline. Imagine you were in that bar when they walk in and tell their stories. Let's not waste any more time on me. Let's all sit back, relax, and enjoy together. What? I got a few more things to do. I'll give the intro. OK, gotcha, gotcha. As you can see, no one will be accusing me of having a green thumb anytime soon. But my guy, Hilton Carter, is a completely different story. This dude's thumbs are green, index fingers are green, his pinky toes probably green, too. I honestly think dude might just be part plant, like a grown-ass group man. But Hilton's story and passion for his green babies is beyond just keeping them alive. It's assuring they are thriving and creating beauty in the homes they occupy. He's a complex soul, and I promise you aren't expecting what's coming next. Your attention, please. Meet Hilton Carter. So I'm at this dinner party with my wife, and it happens again. Someone comes up to me and says, yo. You're that plant dude. You're that plant guy. And in my mind, I'm like, hold up. I'm a filmmaker. I mean, at least that's how I see myself. And my wife looks at me and says, as only she can, you are the plant guy. These people haven't seen your films or your videos. These people know you for what you're doing right now, what you're putting out into the world, and the gift of your artistry you are sharing with them. So at that moment, I really decided, like, you know what? I am the plant guy. So I freely just learned to embrace it. Tap water, filtered water, obviously, spring water, rain water, possibly the tears of an albino giraffe. Cacti could probably use that. The runoff, the condensation that comes out of the greenhouse, definitely get back into the idea of using distilled water. Tears from my own self. The terrariums that we have, maybe that that runs from the plant leaves themselves. We bottle that. It's not a bad idea. Hmm. So after I got my first plant, I realized how much I loved caring for this living, breathing thing. Next thing you know, one plant begat 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 70, and so on and so forth. And the other thing is, lots of them have names. Let's meet the family. We have Mickey. What up, y'all? Frank. The OG. Big Red. Hey. Rubber McGee. Oh, hi. Joey. How you doing? Little Phil. Not that little. Treezus. Hallelujah, y'all. And Young Money. Bruh. OK, Jack, so you finally got me here. You said you wanted to ask some questions. What would you like to ask right now? If you were a superhero, what would your superpowers be? It would probably be the power to control all of green life. You know how Storm, you know Storm from X-Men, how she can control the weather? I would be able to control green life like yourself and all your other friends out there to help me fight bad guys. Oh, okay. So who would the bad guys be? 
There would be low light men. He would be able to control the light in the space or outside. He would make it nighttime all the time. You know, you guys need a lot of light. So we'd fight him off. There'd be Millibug Man who would want to just come and eat all the green life around or Spider Mite Woman. She would spray webs on all of your beautiful foliage so that you would die. Or that'd be that person like the plant sitter who would come in and basically over or underwater you guys making your leaves turn yellow. We don't like those type of people, so that's what my arch nemesis would be, those characters. All right, well, what do you think your superhero name would be? You know what? You know me well. You tell me, what would my superhero name be? What about Father Earth? Ooh, Father Earth. I'm kind of feeling that one, hmm. I like the way it sounds, there's a great ring to it. Being able to control all of you guys in some way, like you're my kids and I'm the father. I like it, let's roll with it. Hey man, I know you're super busy, but can we do our secret handshake? No doubt about it, brother. <sighs> to me, it's always interesting to try to think about plants and relate their way of life to our way of life as humans. Being one with a plant is not just an art form to me, it's a lifestyle I truly benefit from. You just have to think to yourself, but you want to be placed in the corner alone? No. No one wants to be in the corner by themselves, so put a friend in the corner with them if they have to be in the corner. Do you want to be in really great light? Duh, yes. So put them in really great light. Would you want to be sitting next to a heater all day? Well, I mean, some people might actually want that, but your plants don't. So don't put your plant right next to a heater all day. Treat your plants the way you want to be treated, and you know what? You'll both be great. At the end of a long day of watering, tending, and kicking it with my plant fam, we like to take a load off. Blow off some steam, if you will. So I always put on some tracks and just kind of like vibe out. Yes, I play music for my plants. Yes, I dance with my plants. Yes, I play trap music and dance to it with my plants. Whether you call me Father Earth, Plant Daddy, the Plant Guy, whether you call me an artist or an interior stylist or a filmmaker, I hope that I can inspire you to find that thing that makes people tap you on the shoulder at a dinner party and your wife say, that is you and you're dope. was fast. I think some of Hilton's magic already rubbed off on your boy. This baby right here is living her best plant life. I'll see you, girl. <laughs> Moving right along, who would have known fencing is not just a sport, but a bridge? Ibtihaj Muhammad knew that's what I like to call a cratorical question. She knew fencing was a bridge to becoming the first woman to wear hijab competing for the US in the Olympics. She used it as a bridge to becoming the first Muslim American female to earn a medal at the Olympics. Fencing was her bridge to starting her own fashion line. And fencing was the bridge to Mattel who made their first fencer doll after Ibtihaj. Speaking of that, you can probably still find some of my personal dolls on eBay or Craigslist. But not, not like dolls of me, just of my entire doll collection. Yes, I collected dolls in the early 90s, and I ain't scared of y'all. But back to the bridge analogy. There's so much more to Ibtihaj, so let's dig in. Your attention, please. Meet Ibtihaj Muhammad. We didn't know anything about it at the time, but 
it uniquely accommodated our religious beliefs. It was a moment for me to participate in a sport where I didn't have to change any parts of myself. I didn't have to change any parts of my identity. I didn't have to add anything. It was my first time in my life where I was in uniform with everyone else. I am from a small town about 30 minutes west of New York City called Maplewood. I grew up the middle of five kids. My parents are pretty unique in that they had very different lives growing up. I would say that their search for this new faith was similar for a lot of African Americans around that time in the 60s and 70s where it was kind of rejecting this idea of having a faith that maybe was passed on to our ancestors via slavery and really wanting to adopt something that was inclusive uh, no matter your ethnicity and one that kind of rejected the idea that African Americans were inferior in any way. Growing up, we were one of only two Muslim families. And even though um, I wasn't wearing hijab, you know, at seven, eight, nine, ten years old, when I did play sports, when I uh, played t-ball or tennis or track, I didn't wear shorts, I didn't wear tank tops. Like my mom would get me a short sleeve shirt to go underneath the team uniform, or she would get me spandex to go underneath the team shorts. And I'll never forget, we were passing a local high school, and we saw athletes inside of the school cafeteria from the road. They had on long jackets, they had on long pants, what we thought were helmets, and they had swords in their hand. And my mom you know, looked at me and she was like, I don't know what that is, but when you get to high school, I want you to try it out. And it just kind of seamlessly fit into my life, the sport of fencing. When my mom and my dad saw my dedication to, to fencing and kind of this desire to become, you know, better in the sport, I would enter local competitions. And going to these competitions outside of like this, this comfort, I would say, uh, zone that I had in my hometown, I noticed that I was always the only, you know, African American in the competition. I was for sure the only kid in hijab. And it wasn't, necessarily that you noticed, right, that you were different, but it was often that other people acknowledged, you know, that you were different. Was fencing with a coach who, in my opinion, was super misogynistic, did not believe in my ability, did not believe in the abilities of women in general in the sport. And I'll never forget, I, I switched coaches um, to a guy, his name is uh, Akne and Spencer Eel. And the first day I worked with him, he told me I could be one of the best fencers in the world. I never felt representing Team USA as the first Muslim woman in hijab. I never took that moment as pressured. For me, it was an opportunity, you know, to show a different side of Islam than what we're used to seeing. I remember qualifying and it happening simultaneously uh, in this moment of uh, Trump, you know, uh, proposing a Muslim ban. And I remember thinking to myself that it wasn't just a ban that would affect people from particular countries, like, um, you know, people were saying or what the media was saying. I knew that it would incite bigotry, and it would be a defining moment for anyone like me who wore their religion every day and who was visibly Muslim. I knew that there would be pressure competing at the Olympic Games. When I arrived in Rio, I don't know if there was an, a conversation that happened amongst my teammates uh, there, but they decided that they weren't gonna train with me. And so I found myself training with the guys, with guys that I'd never really trained with before, and kind of just praying that all of that hard work that I put in over the past few years would show up for me, you know, on game day. 
So all those difficult things that are happening, whether it be, you know, media trying to create negative stories about me and my family during the games, or, you know, my teammates just being really difficult. Whatever is meant to be will be, and I'm going to only think about things that I can control. But what I can control is me just really trying to win. There will be obstacles because you're African American in the sport. There will be obstacles because you wear hijab, but you can't let those things deter you from your goal of being great. Now those are some skills. I may need to use my saber next time I'm in the kitchen. Can you imagine my Julianne game with this puppy? You know how some people just have names that sound successful, like Barack Obama, Wolf Blitzer, Craig Robinson. You hear these names and you think domination in their respective fields, especially Craig Robinson. Well, when I first heard Nicole LaPointe Jameson, I said, she gotta be a CEO or like the next Oprah. Turns out not only is she a CEO, but the CEO of Evil Geniuses, a legendary esports empire. Let's find out how she reached that pinnacle and maybe see if she has any slots on her team because have you seen my Tetris skills? I'm, I'm nasty with it. Your attention, please. Meet Nicole LaPointe Jamison. One of my fondest memories as a child was evenings. My father came back from work and we'd play backgammon. Before I could actually roll the dice, he'd ask me the probability of a particular roll and to walk through the strategy that I was employing while playing, even though I was six. <laughs> but it was a very natural way for me to love mathematics, love statistics, and be a little bit competitive and not afraid to employ those types of methods to almost anything I did. Loving gaming and connecting with friends over gaming also then opened up traditional video games for me. Platforms like, you know, the PlayStation and the Game Boy were things that um, I maybe spent too much time on as a child, but I love, you know, single player RPG games, MMORPGs online. And that's really what got my eyes open to the professional side of where gaming opportunities would lead. I think eSports is an amazing connectivity platform for especially different cultures or different viewpoints on the world. Because when you're playing, you don't know who's on the other side of the screen, right, when you're gaming. And eSports in particular, when you pull together these teams, they're looking for talent, not based on who you are, but what you can do. And what's been interesting is even though there are strongly held stereotypes on what does it mean to be a gamer in the modern space, you really find that it almost forces open-mindedness because you're put into different environments and different locations and different cultures where what is normal and what is accepted is always flipped on its head. And you see it both on, you know, our, our player rosters have players from all over the world who interact and work together as a team, even if they don't speak the same language. It's been the ethos of Evil Geniuses in that we hire both on the players and the staff side the best of the best. I have found this to be a form of almost self-expression, both in terms of being open of, hey, I'm a, a big gaming nerd, I love this space, but also like who I am and how I present myself. I can come in with big curly hair and jeans and people don't see me as less competent. It's wonderful and it sets a great standard, not just internally at Evil Geniuses, but we set an excellent standard in the space as a whole. And where Evil Geniuses differentiates itself in the space over many of the other esports teams is we lean into the namesake. Evil Genius, you know, we like being bold. We like being saucy. We're okay being questioned for what we do and why we do it because our results speak for themselves. And how that translates into our overall business ethos and architecture is the same way. Let your results speak for who you are and we make sure the doors are open for everyone if you want to be part of our community and our, our team. It's just the bar is high. Uh, I need one of those evil geniuses to give me an internship because right now my skills leave much to be desired. Nicole, keep doing your thing. We'll be watching. Ah. 
So that's all the time we have today, y'all. Don't forget to listen to the podcast where we dive even deeper into our stories. Check it out on iHeart or wherever you get your podcast fix. And as always, don't be afraid to find what you love, share it with the world, and scream from the mountaintop. Your attention, please. Come again now? They want me to do something different on this one? Something funky? Something jazzy? Something craggy? Before I go, let me make something so clear. Black History Month, the best time of the year. Even though they gave us the shortest month. What's up with that? We have no shortage of ways we will stunt. Before I go, let me make something so clear. Black History Month, the best time of the year. Even though they gave us the shortest month. Again, 28 days, really? We have no shortage of ways we will stunt. Before I go, let me make something so clear. Black History Month, the best time of the year. Even though they gave us the shortest month. Maybe we can move it to March. 31 days could be nice. We have no shortage of ways we will stunt. Before, again, you want me to do it again? Before I go, let me make something so clear. Black History Month, the best time of the year. Even though they gave us the shortest month. Well, it is a leap year this year, so we got an extra day, which is cool. We have no shortage of ways we will stunt. Before I go, let me make something so clear. Black History Month, the best time of the year. Even though they gave us the shortest month, we have no shortage of ways we will stunt. Before I go, let me make something so clear. Black History Month, the best time of the year. Even though they gave us the shortest month, we have no shortage of ways we will stunt. I'm Craig Robinson. Your attention, please.
Attention, please. Cut. What's up, y'all? It's me, Craig Robinson. Now listen. Head over to Hulu and watch the full episodes of Your Attention, Please, hosted by yours truly. I promise your little minds will be blown when you see what we cooked up. Amazing stories about powerful new heroes and black culture out there killing it in spaces and places you won't even see coming. So go check it out and let us know what you think in the comments section. I'll be waiting. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Later.